Good morning, Wadarapa. This is Anna Cardno with Wraparound Wadarapa, the um, radio show that we do every Wednesday morning on Arrow FM at 9 o'clock. And uh, it comes to you from the Wadarapa DHB, but the thing we do on this show is chat to all the very fabulous people out there in the community that are providing awesome services for our Wadarapa people. And today I'm lucky enough uh, to have with me in the studio, I have Marina, who we have stolen from Te Haora. And how about you? I'm, I'm going to make Marina talk. Marina doesn't want to be on here, so I'm going to make Marina. Marina, how about you introduce our wonderful guest? Oh, Marina Fano. So I have Danny beside me to talk on behalf of Te Haora this morning. Danny, welcome. I had to do that because she really didn't want to be on here. <laughs> Danny, fun. welcome. It's lovely to have you. And I'm very sorry that we have stolen Marina. A very large part of Marina has come to um, the Wadded Upper DHB to help us out with the COVID-19 uh, program. And so we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on in the show. But right now, Danny's going to tell us a little bit about Te Haora and what you do in the community. So pretending we don't know anything about what you do, how about you let us know? Oh, Atamari Anna, thank you for having us this morning. Um, so I'm from Te Haora. We are a Kopapa Māori mental health and addiction service. We've just recently moved to uh, Chapel Street in the Old Sport Wellington Wairarapa building. Uh, so that's really exciting for us. Um, so we provide addictions counselling and uh, mental health support for our whānau. We've just recently... Um, got a youth mental health contract which uh, supports youth um, aged 10 to 17 uh, with their mental health and any addictions that they might have. Uh, we can provide that support in schools or outside of schools. We're working alongside a number of colleges with our team sitting in the colleges as well, uh, which is really great. It's a really great new service, uh, particularly with the after effects of COVID. Um, Absolutely. The COVID lockdown last year. I bet the schools are really happy to have you in there because I'm sure at schools one of the things that we do here is that the the nurses that are based in schools are really overwhelmed and overworked a lot of the time with the the sort of broad um, issues that come to them from the students. So I guess that you're mopping up quite a bit of a bit of that. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. So we're working alongside uh, with the colleges. We're working alongside the health team. So mm. whether that's their registered nurses or their GP, if they have one sitting in the school one day a week or just their counselling services and youth services that they have, youth workers um, we sit alongside them and it's about supporting them in their roles as well but uh, also identifying any higher needs that we can pick up mm. um, yeah so it's been really good Is addiction in the broadest sense a, an ish, a real issue here in the Wairarapa do you think for youth is it is that something that uh, I think it is it's yeah. probably becoming more prevalent. Um, yeah, I think it may have always been a little bit of an issue, um, but uh, with social media and things like that, making making it people more aware, youth more aware, mm -hmm. um, and they're more eas able to easily access things, mm -hmm. um, makes supporting them in this a bigger challenge. I think social media has got a lot to answer for, really, hasn't it? It has actually become a real, a real issue. We're seeing, you know, how quickly all the ideas and the conversations and the the negatives can get get sort of passed across that social media platform, and it it becomes in itself a real a real problem. Yeah, I think yeah. we're seeing it right across the board when it comes to social media, aren't we? Mm. And I think that um, that youth addiction seems to be um, a real problem for New Zealand as a whole. I don't. I mean, I don't. Think I think it's, it's Warrapa bound, but you're obviously in it and seeing what's happening here. But I think it feels like it's right across the board. I think kids are just growing up so much faster now, aren't they? Mm -hmm. There's just so many things that they're exposed to so early on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so do the, when you're working in the schools and that, in that 10 to 17 year old age group and you're working in those colleges, do the students come to you or do the uh, do the teachers refer them to you or how do you connect with those kids? Yeah so it's a little bit of both. Um, we try and do um, 
uh, we've picked up recently picked up Rathkeel College. So one of the things that we did was we supported them with their wellbeing day. Mm-hmm. So they had a number of services come in and provide little workshops throughout the day, um, alongside some fun fun activities, sporty type activities. Mm-hmm. So we made the connection with the um, particularly the year nine and year ten students. Um, made the connection there, so they got to see our faces. They got to see the people that they're going to be working with, and then we have gone into the school um, to pick up next term to sit alongside their guidance counsellor. So uh, they, uh, rangatahi can either come in and see the guidance counsellor and if there's some identified needs there, then the counsellor can put them through to us. Um, so bring them through, do the introduction um, so they're still feeling safe. Otherwise the um, rangatahi can present without appointments. Um, they can also come into the office uh, if we're not sitting in the school. Mm-hmm. Parents can support them or teachers can support them into the office to um, complete referrals alongside uh, with consent from the parents or caregivers. And, and, and what sort of service do you provide when, when they come and see you? Is it a, a counselling guidance service? Is it putting them in touch with you know, with with medical care, is it what what sort of things can you can you address with them? So, particularly for our youth mental health contract, um, they're coming in. We we do a little bit of fanangatanga, which is getting to know each mm-hmm. other, sharing our stories. Um, we with consent pull a little bit of information from the guidance counsellor or anybody else that might be on board for that rangatahi or that whanau um, and then we have a all with the parents so sit down have a chat with the parents or caregivers about what's going on what some of the challenges might be and based on that we uh, will complete an assessment um, sounds really formal but lots of it we can do just through all with the with the whanau and with the, mm-hmm. the student um, and then from that we create some sort of a plan about around wellbeing how we can support that person so whether there's addiction or some mental health supports um, that are identified we create the plan everybody has their own plan Um, we have a really good uh, fauna water service uh, which is a navigation support service so they look at every that team specifically looks at all the social needs Mm -hmm. Uh, so if there's other needs that aren't specifically mental health, youth mental health and addictions, then we can pull our whanau order team in to um, address the social needs. So whether that's housing, poverty, you know, financial challenges, that sort of things. And even looking at goals and aspirations, so looking at dreams, you know, if a rangatahi would like to look for some work or some work experience or something like that, we can, our whanau order team can identify those and support alongside the school um, to put them in best contact with the best people, bring in the right people at the right time. Fantastic. That sounds absolutely brilliant. You you probably need an enormously wide team to do to, to, to cover all the need. How many people work in Te Helda? Uh, so we have expanded quite significantly over the last 18 months. Um, we've gone from a really small staff of maybe 12, or 12 to 15, now we're at about 25. Oh, wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. And is that indicative of the increased need in, in the Wairarapa, just to, to meet the needs out there? Is it, Or is it to run new programs? Or how has that worked? Um, a little bit of both. So we've had a number of new <coughs> um, contracts, new support services uh, that have come into the service recently, uh, which is really great. But it's also to... And, and those contracts have come in because there's been an identified need Mm -hmm. um, within the community. Mm -hmm. Mm. Fantastic. And um, how does um, Te Haora fit in with the, because there's lots of support services in the community, aren't there? So how does it sort of sit alongside the likes of Yellow Brick Road, which provides that sort of counsel and guidance type services as well? is it that, that um, Te Haura provides a service for Māori specifically and um, and the likes of Yellow Brick Road and the other services pick up sort of the rest of the population or how does that, can anyone come to you or is it people that identify as Māori only? No, absolutely. Anyone can come to us. So while we're a kaupapa Māori service, um, we are an open service inclusive, so we mm-hmm. include everybody. Um, our... Uh, assessments uh, and models of care are Māori based Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where the kaupapa Māori comes from we do karakia and um, ori ori waiata all that sort of stuff um, Mm -hmm. to cover all of that and we have a cultural um, cultural guidance team um, as well who support 
us and our staff if we can't find something or we we as staff need a little bit of guidance um, but in terms of working alongside other services we work alongside everybody so mm-hmm. if if a whānau or a tangata comes to us in need and we can't provide that, we will navigate and work alongside other services that we know that can provide that better than us. Mm-hmm. Mm. Fantastic. Sounds absolutely brilliant. So so that's the youth programme. What other sorts of things are provided at Te Haora? Yeah, we've got lots. So we have adult mental health and addictions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, similar service but for adults, obviously. Um and one of our really cool services is our whānau water service. So uh, this is a, a navigation service. Half of our team sit at Hawara and the other half sit at Whai Ora. Um, and again, it's a, a navigation and we look at social supports. Um, one of the really cool things about whānau water is that it's unencumbered by any criteria. So it's open age. Uh, open time frame there's there's no criteria at all so it's about goals and aspirations about encouraging our whānau to dream um, and look at what they look at what their dream life would look like and what are the barriers that are, are stopping them from achieving that and then we work to take away the barrier one by one um, one of the other really cool things is that we can create programs within that support service. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we're working in St Teresa's School in Featherston. Mm-hmm. At the moment we've been there for maybe 12, 12 months, maybe a little bit more now. Uh, so that program uh, was designed alongside their uh, Positive Behaviour for Life program, so their puberty program. Um, and we looked at supporting young girls in primary school and menstruation Mm -hmm. Uh, so we created a four to six week program around reusable menstrual products um, where to get them how to uh, where to get them how to find them how to pay for them how to use them how to clean them and what that looks like in primary school Um, and we looked at the environmental impact of um, single use products um, and how we can support families to, and encourage them to use um, reusable menstrual products and uh, then all those girls went home years five to eight they all went home they told their mums their sisters um, and all the ladies in their household about the program which was really good that's what we wanted and then all the uh, mums aunties sisters came back and they wanted the program too so we redesigned it specifically to deliver to adults um, and then at the end of the pro- both programs all the women got um, uh, got a starter pack, uh, so they got a reusable menstrual cup, they got a couple of pads and some uh, period knickers to go home and trial out um, and see what works for them. And then later on we went back into the school, we provided the safe space to for them to talk and ask questions, what worked, what didn't work, um, and all that sort of stuff. So that was really exciting. The Kaupapa Māori element of that programme was we learnt about the Atua, so the, the gods that were are associated with menstruation, why we menstruate. Um, we learnt karakia and waiata as well alongside that. So it's a kind of a two-part programme, uh, which was really cool. And that has merged now into its own program and we've got some uh, year five to eight boys on board as well they wanted their own so we've got a male delivering in there and a female delivering to the girls Um, and we're looking at things like anxiety bullying social media um, uh, yeah online behavior safe online behavior vaping Um, so we talk with the school about some of the challenges that they might be having at that time and then we uh, create support things um, to to support the kids and the school at the same time. Our team also have the ability to identify any of the kids that might need some uh, just a little bit more support, so maybe some one-on-one support and then we'd go and have a call it all with the teachers and the parents and see if we can pull them into um, some of our one-on-one services like peer mentoring. Wow, mm. that just sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely incredible. I, I had no idea that you did all of that. Mm. That's wonderful. Yeah. Saint Teresa's School. I know when I was um, managing the Cancer Society many years ago, Saint Teresa's School was fantastic in terms of fundraising and getting involved. They seem to really get into the community and really support the kids really, really well. Mm. Um, from what I know of of the school, yeah. 
Amazing. That sounds fantastic. I, I love working with youth. And you must get um, a real buzz out of the connection that you make with these kids. Yeah, yeah. It's it's cool. There's, we, we work a lot in the South Wadarapa community and there's nothing cooler than walking down the street and people are calling out saying hi. And they know who you are yeah. and you've really connected. Yeah. yeah. And do you, um, do you find that the kids really respond to that? type of learning and that type of um, program that you're running with them where you're, you're in alongside them you're, I imagine you're sort of uh, as much a support and a peer as you are a teacher almost in that kind of environment aren't you? Yeah, yeah we try and keep our roles um, uh, pretty clear mm-hmm. um, but we make some really good connections and I think we can deliver the education and, and support and things like that but we ha- we're really good on providing the safe space afterwards mm-hmm. um, f- to enable our, our the kids to come back and ask questions. Um, and if there's anything that we can't answer, uh, we'll go out and we'll find the answer. We've got some, some really great registered nurses um, on our staff, so if there are any health questions specifically that we can't answer, um, then we'll we'll pull our registered nurses and, and clinicians in and see if we can get them to answer it for them. Mm. Mm. Fabulous. And that connection that you're making with the teachers and that I, I feel like it's almost it, it's it's a totally different way of learning and supporting our kids than when I was at school, which was, you know, 100 years ago, where it was very much the teacher at the front of the class instructing you and it was very academic and it was all about sport and studies. And there wasn't that sort of social support stuff. And I, I went to a very privileged boarding school in Martin, Natawa. It was a wonderful school, but it really didn't have that kind of structure around supporting the kids so much. I mean, there was a chaplain there and there were people that you could go and talk to if you wanted to, but it certainly wasn't pulled into part of the everyday curriculum whereas I think now and maybe it's that real focus on well-being that we've all had in the last sort of 18 months since COVID's kind of reared its ugly head and and we're focusing much more now um, I think in almost every environment on support of and well-being of people but the whole bringing that well-being approach bringing that health aspect and that um, that sense of of care and nurturing into schools is something that we're seeing a lot more of now Mm. isn't it and Mm. I think I think that must be said up our kids to be a lot more prepared for you know for real life outside of school yeah I know when I was a kid and we'd head off to university (laughs) after college and just totally completely unprepared for what the big wide world looked like Mm, mm. and I think now maybe maybe our kids because they are growing up so fast with all that social media pressure I mean that's got to be a part of it that they just get exposed to all of the everything way earlier than we ever ever did yeah yeah yeah. So, so say a um, a kid comes to you, and as part as part of your service, and that that dealing with addiction, presumably there's both the 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 treatment and the care around trying to deal with the addiction itself, but also that strength and support in terms of that ownership of who they are and themselves as a person and all that sort of care and and nurturing and support that you guys provide in that sort of counselling guidance space mm, is yeah. Right? yeah yeah um, so we can um, if through some of our programs like I said there has to be some one on one support we have a really good peer mentoring service um, so that is designed to be one on one it's long term um, and we can also, through talking with the parents or the caregivers, um, we can also maybe identify some needs that might be at home as well, that mum and dad or nana and granddad, there's lots of um, grandparents raising uh, raising their grandchildren now. Um, so if there's some supports needed there, we've got a really great parenting support service um, where we can go into the home, we can deliver five to ten sessions um, around the challenges that are that the caregivers, grandparents, parents identify specifically for them Mm -hmm. um, and they get their own kind of support program that's specifically tailored for their family and their children. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's really good, we can do that. And then if they're further from there, if there's other social supports identified, then they can come into whanau order. Um, So we have a really good um, ability to internally refer to all of our services and pull our whole team in. Um, yeah, like I said, bringing the right people in at the right time. And if we don't have uh, the right supports, we'll go out and find them for you. 
Fantastic. And what about, I mean, I imagine some of the issues are financial. They're around, um, you know, maybe maybe not having employment or, or not having enough money to, to care for the family. Do, what's, do you connect with the likes of WINS and things like that and provide budget advice and... Is that, is that part of it as well? Yeah, sure. So we would, we if there are some financial challenges, we would be looking to make sure that people are getting their full entitlement. So working alongside WINS mm. and, um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety for our whānau having to go into WINS. Um, and so we would support them out to their appointments. Is, it, is, that, is that anxiety, is, is it a pride-based thing or is it... Is it um Fear of the unknown, or or what? What's that? What's the what's the issues there about yeah. going in for the support? Probably a little bit of both. Right. Um, yeah, it can be it can be really hard, really challenging for our whānau to reach out and actually make those connections and say that they need help. Mm-hmm. Um, so while we have that trust, we, you know, we create that trust through that whanangatanga process. Then we support them, and and they trust us, so we can bridge that gap and make those connections for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's part of our job, to, to help our whānau touch base with all the other services and have trust in all the other services. It's something I worry about quite a lot, actually, in terms of um, the work that I do as communications manager at the DHB, <coughs> is we can get out there and we can assist people only to the extent that they know about us and they know about the service and they know about what we can provide. I worry about the people that are out there that that we don't reach. Yeah. You know, I think, and, and sounds like, you know, part of the brilliant thing about the work that you do because you're in the community and you're connecting with the people directly and their whanau, that they they talk and they share that message and then you're, you're probably, you know, the work, the word about what you do just travels doesn't it so yeah. so people will be hearing a lot more about the services that you can provide yeah and the great thing also about our um particularly our whānau water team is they know everything uh, they know everything that's available in the community they know how to get there how to refer all of that sort of stuff they're really good so they are the best people to pull in all the other supports at the right time mm. um yeah and it's really important yeah, it's that sort of any door's the right door. You know, yeah. we hear that said quite a lot and, and often um, people don't really know what it means. But the, the concept that obviously works so well with you guys and then the work that you do is that, you know, if you're hearing about an issue from people and, and you're not the right person, mm. it's still the right door because you'll connect them with the, you know, who can help, which yeah. is such an important thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's that, you know, you're not leaving anybody just hanging that they've told their story and then nothing happens about it. Yeah. Yeah, which is always a real risk, isn't it, that people yeah. end up having to tell their story and they're not getting the support. Yeah. 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 And um, one thing I did want to talk about this morning was, was COVID and the impact um, on our community out there. Do you think that the lockdown, you know, there's a lot of talk out there nationally around lockdown and how it affected our kids. It, do, you, do you see evidence of that when you're working out there in the community? There is. There's lots of... Um, and it will likely present more and more, but there's lots and lots of um, anxiety and worries about... The impact of COVID, you know, uh, are we going into lockdown again, um, you know, and, and what that might look like in the community. Yeah, there's lots. And it was mostly, do you think, a fear of the virus itself or was it a fear of just that loss of connection with friends? Is, was that probably a part of it? Uh, yeah, probably both. Yeah. Um, a fear of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Um COVID was so prevalent overseas and you know we're all stuck at home watching the news um, so lots of lots of fear created around that which would have been really hard because you can't make the connections out of the community to help manage that like what you normally would do if if we weren't in lockdown. So how did you operate in lockdown? Did you just do sort of phone based services if you couldn't be out there with your with your whanau and them? Well, I had broken my arm during lockdown. You so broke I your arm. <laughs> you broke your arm. But I There's do know that there. we, um, we, yeah, we did. So we did phone contacts instead. Yep. Um, uh, half of our team were in the office and half weren't, and then switched around. Right. So you kept those connections going, and yeah. you kept the service going yep. for people. Um, Must have been quite hard for a team that's so sort of hands on and face to face. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It was, but. Um, so uh, there was a section of our team who went out and we delivered food parcels once mm. a week 
mm-hmm. um, went out and delivered care packs. So whether they were sanitisation packs, um, you know, gloves, disinfectant soaps and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. uh, one week and then food parcels the next week, sometimes both. Mm-hmm. Um, so Fano also got a little bit of connection from the gate uh, when they had their boxes dropped off and we covered the whole Wadarapa. So there was something like 400 parcels mm. a week that we delivered every week wow. over COVID. Wow. Mm. What a great service. It sounds amazing. So I'm going to bring Marina back into this conversation. Is that all right, Marina? Marina's a little bit shy. Beautiful Marina. Um Now, she is leading our wonderful COVID vaccination program. So Marina is our operations manager. She's doing a fantastic job of making sense of a very, very complex vaccination rollout. And uh, we love having you on board. Marina, I just wanted to have a little chat about, I think there's still some confusion out there with people about when they can get their vaccination. So right now we're vaccinating group two which is our mostly, isn't it, our frontline healthcare workers. But we're also doing the over 70s, yeah? Yeah, so we're currently focusing on the um, demographics for our Māori Pacifica Islander whānau that are over 75 um, because they are our most vulnerable in the community at the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I know that there's a whānau, a Pacifica whānau arranged for 2nd of May. So we're inviting all of our Pacific uh, community in to hear a little bit and Dr Arpi's, you know, coming to coming to talk to them and tell them a little bit about uh, about COVID, about the vaccination, why we do it and how it's going to protect us. But out there in the community, there's a whole lot of misinformation, isn't there? Mm. There's a whole lot of stuff that's being delivered to mailboxes. There's a whole lot of propaganda. There's people out there at the train stations delivering stuff saying you don't need to wear masks anymore. Now, we know that's not right. Mm. Yeah. So what um, we're guiding people to um, the Ministry of Health website and to www.covid19.govt.nz. That's where all the all the right information is. Um when do you think uh, we're likely to be delivering vaccinations for that for that next group, which is that group three lot? So that's, I think, over 65-year-olds across the community. We're hoping to um, have all of our kaumatua and our 75-year-olds or 70-year-olds done by the end of May, but that's an ever-evolving process and we're constantly reviewing that and getting updates from the Ministry of Health, so we are guided by them as well. Sure, in terms of when we can roll out to people, but sounds like probably, you know, beginning of June or somewhere around June, yeah. we'll hit that Group 3 yeah. lot, um, which is the, um, now that's the over 65 people with um, pre-existing medical conditions, isn't it? Yeah. That, that group, and then presumably we'll get them done and then soon after that, some July or or soon after July will be hitting the rest of the community and everybody will be coming in to get vaccinated. But they're not just going to have to come into us, are they? No, so we are working um, with our external agencies such as Hawora Faiora, um, KKW and Rangitane to see how we can work together on a collaboration to meet the needs of our family and our whānau out there in the community. So there'll be us taking vaccinations out into it the could be. community. Um, nothing has been solidified yet. Right. Yeah, but hopefully we'll have uh, a lot more accessible vaccinations yeah. happen so that we can get. We want the ultimate goal is to have everybody vaccinated, isn't mm. it? I mean, yes. that's that's our plan. Yep. Big ask, big <laughs> ask. Like normally in a normal year, um, what it up a DHB or what it up a uh, in total, including all of our medical practices, we do about nine thousand flu vaccines a year, and this is like two vaccinations per person for everybody over the age of 16 it's 90,000 mm. vaccinations not 9,000 so 10 times what we normally do as well as flu mm. it's a really big effort you've got a great team working though haven't you and your vaccination crew yes we have a really good team and it's going to be going as we move through these stages and groups and tiers that we have to achieve mm. Mm. yeah it takes a whole army to make it happen doesn't it Yep. It seems so easy when um, Ashley Bloomfield stands up there and, and you know, does his media stand-ups and talks to people about vaccination. You don't sort of recognise all the huge amounts of work and people resource and everything that goes on in the background to, to make it happen. Yeah. But I have a whole lot of confidence in your team. I think you've got some really cool people working in that vaccination uh, rollout team and, you know, you'll make it happen. Marina's fantastic about mm-hmm. getting people 
getting people doing what they need to be doing. So, hey, listen, that's um, just about us for the day, but it's been really amazing to hear about Te Haora. I, I had no idea the enormous amount of services that you provide. I know that you're a great organisation and you've got some cool people that work with you as well. I know Ron particularly well, and um, and he's always very proud of, of the team. But it's been really neat to hear a little bit more about all the work that you've done, particularly the stuff that you're doing in the schools. They must be really pleased to have you on board. Mm, hope so. Yeah, and you look like you really enjoy your job. I do, love yeah. my job. Yeah, I bet you yeah. do. Yeah, great. Hey, listen, guys, it's been beautiful having you on board and having you along for the show. Thank you very much. Have Thank a wonderful you. Wednesday.